What's going on, everybody? We're back here on the factory tour. I'm here again with Ben Winkler, who joined us just a few weeks ago, but I was eager to bring him back again. He, he really crushed the last episode, so wanted to pick his brain some more, talk with him again. Um, we really, me and Chris went deep on the tight ends last week, and we're going to kind of take that format and transfer it onto this show. Uh, we're going to get a big breakdown of the quarterback position. We've got some tiers, and we're going to just work our way through these tiers, talk about some interesting players, talk about some game theory. Uh, I'm very excited to get into it. Before we do that, Ben, how are you today? I'm doing pretty good. Uh, excited to talk about some quarterbacks today for sure. Yeah, I mean, you know, it's an interesting position. It's hard to know the right way to allocate your resources in super flex leagues. Obviously, they're a, a hot commodity. The elite ones are very expensive and all of them are pretty expensive, to be honest. So it's it's going to be an interesting one to navigate. We'll look at some ADP. We'll look at some tiers, like I said. Before that, we're going to start off with a little game that is unrelated to the quarterback position. We're going to talk some wide receivers. Before that, before the thing that's before the thing, uh, I want to make an announcement. This is a big one. I can't keep it to myself, so I'm really excited. Um, next week on the Factory Tour, our 10th episode, we are going to have our first ever non-DFF guest. So I got the, got the green light to reach out to some other people. And I've got a very special guest for next week. I will be talking with Jacob Sanderson, uh, who you may know from the Full Tilt Dynasty podcast, the Sweat and Bullets podcast, the Bulletproof Discord, et cetera, et cetera. Um, really, really smart dude. One of my favorite guys in the industry. And I'm just really excited to talk with him next week. You should be excited. So don't miss that. All right. Uh, if you're watching on YouTube, subscribe. If you're on Spotify, Apple Podcasts, just follow the show. Like You're not going to want to miss that one. So just had to get that out of the way. Um, let's get back to our regularly scheduled programming here. Ben, did you bring a crystal ball with you today? I did not bring a crystal ball with me, but I am ready to talk about some receivers. Okay. Well, wish you were a little bit more prepared, but <laughs> we're going to work with what we've got. Uh, yeah. Because what we're going to do here is we're going to look at the top 12 dynasty wide receivers currently, uh, and then we're going to make some predictions about how that list might change over the next 12 months. So June of 2024, who are our dynasty wide receiver ones? So obviously we need to start here with the actual list. So per Bulletproof ADP, we've got Justin Jefferson, Jamar Chase, CD Lamb, AJ Brown, Garrett Wilson, Jalen Waddle, Amon Ross St. Brown, Chris Olave, Tyreek Hill, T. Higgins, Stephon Diggs, and Jackson Smith and Jigba as our top 12 dynasty wide receivers. So, Ben, 12 months from now, who are some names not on that list uh, that you're expecting to see? Some names not on that list that I'm expecting to see. For one, I, I want to throw Devontae Smith into this conversation. Um, I think that him and JSN especially are two really comparable guys who I have ranked sort of back to back in my rankings and I have Smith ranked above above JSN just because he's proven that he can thrive in the same role that we're hoping JSN gets. Um, and we already know that Devontae Smith has that and he's going to have it for a really long time. Um, he also has a couple different traits that I think JSN lacks. Um, like I think that Devontae Smith's speed is... Um, a bit more remarkable than than JS any of JSN's athletic traits. Um, so I like Devonte Smith a lot, and I think that he could, if not he, if he's not already for you, pushing that top twelve tier. Um, yeah, that's you know. that's an interesting one. He is currently the wide receiver thirteen by ADP. He goes one slot after JSN, so he's right there on the precipice of that top twelve. Which, to be fair, in startup rankings, is a pretty arbitrary number, but it's how we like to do things in fantasy top twelves. Um, so I like that call. I, my concern is like, is he capped in that Philly offense playing with AJ Brown and Goddard with lower passing volume? I think he has all the talent in the world. I'm just worried that they're never going to see enough volume to really push him into that wide receiver one um, discussion, but he's, he's right there on the edge. So if, you know, if he can somehow improve on what he did this year, maybe catch a few more touchdowns, it's certainly possible that he could leap in there, maybe leapfrog someone like T Higgins uh, or JSN, like you said. I'll throw out uh, Drake London, who is currently the wide receiver 15 in ADP. As far as I'm concerned, Drake London is already a top 12 dynasty wide receiver, but the masses don't agree. 
He had an absolutely epic rookie season. He was top five in the NFL in target share. His per route statistics were really, really impressive. He was just held back by really bad quarterback play and one of the lowest pass rates we've seen over the last half decade or so. And honestly, I just think this year he's going to be better because the Falcons are just naturally going to have to throw the ball more. I don't think Desmond Ritter can be worse than Marcus Mariota was last season. And honestly, London's splits with Desmond Ritter were better. Um, Kyle Pitts was out. I'll grant you that, but he performed well with Ritter. I think he's going to continue to perform well. And people are just kind of, kind of catch up to the fact that this guy is really, really talented. So that's one that I think is almost a lock. Like if I had to, if I had to bet on anybody, not in the top 12 being there next season, that's going to be my guy. Other than that's a good one. Yeah. yeah. I really should have pointed that one out too. Cause I think I have him at like seven or eight in my rankings right now. And he's not in the, that ADP top 12, but I don't know, like you said, he does a lot of stuff really, really well, and he's going to really pop off this season. I think. Well, I appreciate you leaving him for me. I would have been kind of upset if you took him and Smith. So I appreciate it. I'll throw out another name here. Who is a guy not yet in the NFL. I know this isn't a Debbie show, but you should be aware when you're thinking about rankings for next season, Marvin Harrison jr. Is already pushing top three dynasty wide receiver status. Uh, whether or not you think that might be reasonable, Ben, you're more of a Debbie guy. Do you see, I think we can both agree. Harrison's going to be in that top 12 as soon as next season. Do you oh, think yeah. he could even be a top five consensus dynasty wide receiver? Uh, in- I talked, yeah, I talked with, with drew about Marvin Harrison jr. Last week on our, on our show. And he said actually that he would rank Marvin Harrison today as the third most valuable receiver in dynasty. So Regardless of whether you think he is up there yet or how you approach um, dealing with Debbie assets in your in your leagues compared to NFL players, Mm -hmm. he is in that range and he's going to be warranting that kind of value as far as trading for him or trading him away. So whether that means to you, oh, I should sell him right now because I don't think that's where his value is at. That's what you should do um, and vice versa. But yeah, no, he's Mm -hmm. he's crazy. He's just different. He's going to be really, really good for sure. And I, and I think that matters when you think about trading 2024 first round picks, right? I'm not really somebody who goes out and buys wide receivers high, especially with first round picks. But, but right now, like if you have a pick that looks like it could be early, don't rush out and trade that for a Garrett Wilson or a CD lamb or an AJ Brown, because that pick could very easily turn into Marvin Harrison, uh, who might be ranked ahead of those guys from day one, at least in terms of consensus. So, you know, something to think about when you're making trades. Uh, how about one more guy, maybe like a dark horse, somebody who is not someone you'd project inside the top 12, but someone you think could get there. And I'll go first. Cause I didn't actually ask you to prepare this. So I'll, I'll give mine first, give you a chance yeah. to, to think of one, uh, for me, it's going to be Christian Watson, who is currently the wide receiver 18 by ADP. And like I said, this isn't something I'm projecting. I don't expect Christian Watson to be a wide receiver one, but when I look at that next tier of guys, You've got some older players like Cooper Cup and Devontae Adams who, while being excellent players, they're not rising in dynasty value. And then there are guys that are pretty clear, like wide receiver two types. Uh, you know, you've got your um, your Jerry Judys, you've got your DJ Moores, Michael Pittmans. I don't really think anybody in that range has what it takes to jump into that wide receiver one zone. But Watson, you know, he was really, really efficient last year on – not a tiny sample, but uh, certainly less than a full season, but he has that athletic ability. He had the, the yards per route run targets per route run that you see from those elite players. And so if he can, you know, refine his route running, if he can maintain that in a larger sample, he's the kind of guy going into year two who could make a big leap. Um, kind of like we saw from DK Metcalf in his second season. So that is going to be my dark horse pick. Ben, did I give you enough time to come up with a name? As far as a dark horse goes, a couple guys came or are coming to my head right now, and it's sort of like the DK Metcalf, Cooper Cup, Terry McLaurin kind of guys, who I think are really being, or not really being, but they're flying under the radar quite a bit at the moment. And as far as the general dynasty landscape goes, these are guys who could easily have multiple top 12 finishes left in them based on their situation, based on the talent, based on their uh, past track record of production. And no one sort of thinks of them in that price range at all which is totally fair because like they don't have some of the other circumstances that maybe a Tyree Kill or a Stefan Diggs have Mm -hmm. who are both tied to good quarterbacks and they've 
shown that their production is not going to really wane down with age. But I think that um, McLaurin and Metcalf, especially to me, have like they could have like three or four top 12 seasons over the next four seasons. And uh, and they're not really being valued in in this top 12 range. So if we play dynasty in a three year window, like we like we say we do, I think that those three guys uh, or those two especially are sort of being undervalued. I think DK is a good call because he has been valued there before and he has that vividness bias where, you know, he's a big guy, big fast player, makes a lot of highlight real plays. And so if he has like a 10 or 12 touchdown season this year, you could really see him jump back up. McLaurin's a really tough sell for me. I think he's already 27. We've never seen him put up a wide receiver one season. And so I think even if he were to surprise and maybe put it all together for once, I don't know if people would shift their priors enough to get him up there. Like, I feel like he would be going maybe at best where you see Devonte Adams going right now. Um, I don't know if he has the juice to get up there, but like you said, it's a dark horse. He has always had strong, you know, target shares, air yard shares. And so maybe he just has a, a crazy year out of nowhere. Yeah. And the, the other thing that I think is interesting to point out there is that I think those two were both in the same rookie class as AJ Brown and the age discount, on those two, I, McLaurin was an older prospect, but DK especially seems to be getting faded more than than AJ is for his mm -hmm. age. So. Well, I happen to think AJ Brown is overvalued in Dynasty. Um, I don't think he will be falling out of the top 12 by next year, but I do mm -hmm. think his, his current price at the 201 wide receiver four overall is pretty unwarranted. And I'm, e I'm an it's Eagles steep. fan and I am a massive AJ Brown fan. I mean, I absolutely love him. My son happens to be named Arthur. I didn't name him after AJ Brown, but it's just an interesting fact. Uh, but having said, he's he's going too high for a guy who we've never seen actually post that like top three wide receiver season. He's never even sniffed 20 points per game in a season like we've seen guys like Cooper Cup do, Justin Jefferson, Jamar Chase. And he's he's not old, but he is getting into that part of his career where he's not still rising, right? Like he is what he is. He's, I think he's 26 and he's going to continue to be really good. But I, I just, if he continues to be what he has been, I think that's a, a lot to pay for a guy with maybe a lower ceiling than people would like to think, uh, especially in an offense that's frankly never going to be near the league lead in pass attempts. Um, so yeah, I, I, that's kind of a tough sell for me. I would, I would like to see Brown falling back into that wide receiver six zone maybe in the late second but where he's going ahead of you know certain quarterbacks and stuff is just a little bit too much for me yeah i definitely think that i agree with you there that he's just a tad overvalued he's just like a tier below i think those really elite guys and like you said he's kind of done his rise and last year was sort of like the okay well if he's going to put together like a, a super elite receiver season this is going to be it and he was really good last year but he was kind of up and down a little bit he had a couple off weeks and it didn't turn into the like top three fantasy production that we might have hoped for for him at some point yeah i mean he could have caught a couple more touchdowns but outside of that i mean he was really maxed out from an efficiency standpoint like he was really performing well on his usage and mm -hmm. Jalen Hurts was about as efficient as he could possibly be. So yeah. outside of having a couple extra touchdowns, there's really nowhere to go. Uh, and exactly. So yeah. I just I don't see the I don't see room for him. To, it's ta like he's an excellent talent. It's just sometimes the situation does cap you a little bit, and I think that's that's one of those situations. And we we can say with confidence it's really not going to change anytime soon. They're both on huge contracts, uh, so that's the pairing we're going to have. And Hurts is a rusher. He's going to run. He takes pass attempts out of the offense and it, it does limit his weapons a little bit. So just something to think about if you can pivot your AJ Browns into, you know, Garrett Wilson plus Chris Olave plus that's something I'm absolutely looking Drake to London. do. Yeah. Let's look at, well, for sure you get a huge plus there. I mean, mm -hmm. Drake London plus a 25 first is a deal you could absolutely get done and I would make it in a heartbeat. So take a look at that. Let's talk about some guys that could move out of this top 12 real quick. Uh, uh, obviously there are a couple guys that are nearing their thirties. So Tyree kill and Stefan Diggs are inside that top 12. I think it's pretty easy to imagine, especially if either of them has a, a slightly down year that they could be moving out of the top 12, even if they finish as top six, seven wide receivers in seasonal leagues, they could move down into that zone where you see Adams and cup right now. Cause they're about a year younger. So that's an easy call. Are there any other guys you could see making that move? 
Um, me and you have both talked about this on like Discord and Twitter before, but I think that you should keep your eye on Jalen Waddle and mm -hmm. see what he does this year. Um, it's just kind of a little sus over there as far as like you have all the analytics to back it up, but as far as the traits in the film goes, um, he's a great football player, but there are a lot of like weird habits he has. He's sort of a weird mover and uh, he's kind of weird at the catch point too. And when you're getting such low volume like he's going to be getting, you have to be really, really, really on top of your stuff when you're getting targeted. And being weird at the catch point is it's just scary. And, and I, I'm, I'm a little sussed out by Jalen Waddle, especially with like the top six dynasty wide receiver valuation that he has right now. So um, I'd watch out for him. Yeah, I, I really went off on Jalen Waddle and the show I did with Chris a couple weeks back. The we talked about some startup targets and fades and he's a heavy fade for me at his current ADP wide receiver six around the 208. And, you know, I didn't know anything, you know, any of that stuff about how he plays specifically. But what I do know is he has by far the lowest, he had by far the lowest target share last season of any of these other top 12 options. So if you see his efficiency this year come plummeting back to earth, like we saw from Debo Samuel last season, yeah, he could absolutely fall back to that Devonta Smith zone, that T Higgins zone. If he's not outside the top 12, I would expect him to be closer to 12 uh, than six, which is where he currently sits. So that's a good call. And he was going to be my dark horse candidate, but I'll throw out T Higgins as well, who has been super solid throughout his career, but he's basically been the same guy every single year. He hasn't shown, uh, you know, an upward ascension. He kind of just is who he is. He's a really good beta receiver. I don't, I don't, necessarily love that term but i don't know how else to phrase it he just if jamar chase were to miss time i think he can step in and, and be really impressive but as it stands he's gonna be like a 20 you know 22 23 percent target share guy he's gonna get his 1100 yards his eight touchdowns i just think if he does that again and he's another year older and he has uncertainty around his contract maybe he's not gonna play with joe burrow anymore like I think it would be very easy to see him fall back into that 14, 15 range. Yeah. From like a pure fantasy perspective, Higgins kind of reminds me of AJ Brown a little bit, actually, where he's kind of just like prone to more dud weeks than you would like. And it sort of just feels like when you're in season, it just sort of feels like they're like a frustrating player to own and to a frustrating guy to roster and be relying on for points week in and week out. So I, I definitely am with you on Higgins there. The poor man's AJ Brown. Yeah, um, I guess but, we can yeah. call him that. And then yeah, as I mean, far as these older guys go too, I just want to shout that like with Diggs and Hill, they're those are the two at the risk of sounding obvious, those are the two with the best chance of falling out of the top twelve here. And cause you're just like one injury away, you're through like a one five or six stretch game stretch of of bad production away, and like their values are gonna be so volatile over the course of this like next season. So yeah, I mean, Cooper Cup was the wide receiver one overall in points per game last year. And because he didn't do anything down the stretch due to his ankle injury, he's going behind those guys. It, you know, that's how fickle it can be. They're all roughly the same age, but Cup's getting that discount because he wasn't useful in the fantasy playoffs. And that's what people remember. So it's, it is, it comes quick for the older wide receivers. They're still good investments, in my opinion. They can absolutely help you win a championship, but you just need to be aware of how quickly their value can, can change. That being said, I want to close out this segment with my best guess at next year's top 12 wide receiver, uh, dynasty wide receiver one, something we can look back on, you know, a little time capsule. Uh, we can revisit this next year in June. Maybe, maybe I can bring Ben back on, but here's my top 12 prediction. Uh, Justin Jefferson, Jamar Chase, Marvin Harrison, Jr. CD lamb, Garrett Wilson, Chris Olave, AJ Brown, Amon Ross, St. Brown, Jackson Smith and Jigba, Drake, London, Jalen Waddle, Tyree Kill. Fair enough. Was Olave in there? He was. He was number okay. six. Yeah. Okay. No, I like that. Um, I like that a lot. You know, I I see. I like Amon Ra at eight. I was I was waiting to hear where he was. So that's that's cool. I I do see him holding a lot of his value um, over this next season. I think that I think that he'll have a big year. And I I like London at nine too. Um, Marvin at three is awesome. I, I do get a I do get a, a big kick out of that because I think that I think that he's really going to be pushing that. I will say I I'm I have a little like tingling at the bottom of my stomach about Garrett Wilson, and I really think that this could be a year where he where he kind of 
leaps over cd lamb and pushes himself into the uh top three top four so totally I, I have a back-to-back yeah. i could see it happening either way you know yeah and and to be clear like this is my prediction like i would have drake london higher i'm just mm-hmm. guessing that maybe his production is still going to lag a little bit behind his peripheral numbers and people are going to see the potential but it won't necessarily be fully realized so mm-hmm. that's my rationale there i do still have jalen waddle in there i think he's just it's going to be hard for people to shake their preconceived conceptions of like who he is as a player. And so yeah. he'd really, I think he'd really have to underperform to fall all the way out of the top 12. So that's where I'm going to put him for now. Um, that'll conclude the wide receiver predictions. Let's get on to the main event, the quarterbacks. And what I've done here is I've got basically all of the relevant quarterbacks in dynasty startups, all the way from Patrick Mahomes, who goes at the 101 to Baker Mayfield who goes at the 1408 as the 34th quarterback off the board. I took all those guys and I grouped them into some tiers. The tiers are basically just a combination of where they go in ADP with my own subjective sort of cutoffs to split them up into tiers. Sometimes it's just because there's a big gap. Uh, Sometimes it's a little more arbitrary. I'll explain as we go. We're going to work our way through each of these tiers in order. And we'll just talk a little bit about some of the players, some, some theory around them. And uh, I gave all the tiers names because I thought that'd be fun. So yeah. tier tier one, we have the aliens. That is Patrick <laughs> Mahomes, <laughs> Josh Allen, and Jalen Hurts. These are our aliens. And there's not maybe a whole lot to say about these three guys. They are the first three picks in like every dynasty startup that you'll see. Ben, any thoughts on Mahomes, Allen, and Hurts? I don't know. Alien is kind of the perfect word, especially when you're talking about um, – Josh Allen and Pat Mahomes. And I think that Hertz has played his way into that tier. So, um, yeah, I mean, it it always just makes me think about that, that one AFC, AFC, uh, second round game with between, between Mahomes and Allen and the display that they put on and how everyone at home was watching. And they were like, Oh gosh, we got to get one of these guys or else we're not going to be competitive for a long, long time. Especially me as a Raiders fan. I was like, yeah, no, I've seen Mahomes and Herbert doing this kind of stuff all year long and nice, nice that everyone else is on the same page, but yeah, I don't know. (laughs) Like, like, like you said, there's not much that really can be said that isn't already being, or it hasn't already been said, especially about these three guys. So what what I'll say is that, uh, you want these players on your team. Uh, I don't know if that's a hot take, uh, but you, you want to go out and get them like literally like anything that you can give up for one of these quarterbacks is probably worth it. Like if you think you're overpaying, <laughs> if you think you're overpaying, add another first and that's probably a fair trade, okay? It they're insane. Like just for reference over the past 10 seasons, there have been 11 total quarterback seasons of 24 or more points per game. That's in a four point passing touchdowns cuz that's what they had on Fantasy Pros if you play 6 point just boost all the numbers a little bit. Point is 11 total QB uh, quarterback seasons with 24 more points per game. Um, Three of those are Patrick Mahomes. Three of them are Josh Allen. One of them is Jalen Hurts. One is Lamar Jackson. The only other names on that list were Aaron Rodgers in 2020, Cam Newton in 2015, I believe that was the MVP year, and then Mm -hmm. Peyton Manning in 2013 when he broke every passing record known to man. So basically, those three guys, plus Lamar, who we'll talk about in a second, those are your guys who can like break your league, absolutely destroy the competition. They did it last year. There was a huge gap between those three and then the QB four Joe Burrow in points per game. So there's really no price too high. They're so young. They have all this, these years out in front of them and they are offering a ceiling that just frankly cannot be matched by the field like yep. in any way. And that rule that you said of like, if you think that you're overpaying out of first, that logic also applies when you have one of these three players. Please do not. We have like a rule, I feel like, in the DFF Discord where it's like, just don't trade Mahomes. Just don't do it. No, and every don't time do we it. see a Mahomes trade, we're just like, nope, you should have kept Mahomes. It's it's just like, it's just they're they're insane. They're insanely valuable and they're not replaceable assets at all. Right. You can only start so many players. And when you trade Mahomes away, it's like, okay, well, what are you getting? You're getting a package of assets that yeah. in theory hold more valuable value than Mahomes. But unless you're sh- like, unless all of those players are recognizing their ceiling and they can all be in your lineup at the same time, the actual advantage you're getting probably isn't as big as you think. So 
don't over don't overthink it with these guys. If you have them, just hold on to them. You don't need to trade them. You can generate value for your team in other ways. You you want these aliens on your team. Now, looking at the next tier of guys, we have the young elites. These are Lamar Jackson, Joe Burrow, Justin Herbert, Trevor Lawrence, and Justin Fields. So Lamar Jackson, I think, is the most interesting name here because there's a very easy argument, frankly, to include him in the tier above. The only reason that I didn't is because he never goes in the top three. He is he is always fourth or later. So the market does not see him as interchangeable with any of these three at all. And so I, I'm not putting him in that tier. But he had one of those 24-point-per-game seasons, like I mentioned, and he has all the ceiling in the world. He has He's back on his, his big contract. He's got the best weapons around him he's ever had. I think the Ravens could be one of the best offenses in the league this year. And we could see Lamar Jackson jump back into that range as soon as next season. Do you think that's possible? Oh, yeah, I do think it's possible. I actually had this happen to me in our recent DFF startup that we did where Hertz fell to four. And I had my mind set on taking Lamar at four because that's who I was expecting to be there. Mm -hmm. And I took Lamar over Hertz still just because I, had, I was already set on it. And maybe that's a stubbornness thing. But the point is the Ravens are going to be really good next year, like you said. Um, I'm super excited to see what Todd Monken cooks up. You've got an amazing receiving core that really is going to fit the style that they're going to go for. Um, and then you have the best rushing upside in the league from the quarterback position. Um, this isn't like a Jalen Hurts or an Anthony Richardson kind of rusher. This is like the best, most elusive runner in the entire NFL. Um, so I don't know. I think that I think that there's a really strong argument for the tier one. Um placement for Lamar and I think that the only thing like you said holding him back from that placement is just the general consensus of of what he's valued at at the moment yeah yeah exactly I wouldn't be surprised at all if Lamar Jackson's the overall QB1 this season and he's not he's right all. back in that range yep. the only the only reason I would take Hertz over Lamar in all scenarios is because I think they have identical ceilings and I know that Hertz is valued ahead um yep and also, just due to Lamar having some unfortunate injury luck the past couple of years, I don't necessarily think that he's injury prone, but I think that his value is more fragile due to injury in the sense that if he has another injury, people are just going to start writing him off as like, he can't play a full season. He's just going to get hurt. Whereas with Hertz, he's like never had an injury. And so I feel like he has a few, he can take a few strikes, you know, on his injury punch card before people are starting to worry about it. That's a small yeah. detail. Uh, that's just my line in the sand. Like I said, Lamar's mm -hmm. my first guy in this tier, 104 in startups, followed by uh, a few pocket passers or, you know, primarily passers, not rushers, in mm -hmm. Joe Burrow, Justin Herbert, Trevor Lawrence, and then rounded out with Justin Fields, who's kind of like a guy we hope can be Lamar, but hasn't shown the same ability just yet. People yeah. are people have their interest peaked. So how do you see that that group? Um, yeah, I have them ranked the same way that you do with Burrow, then Herbert, then Lawrence and Fields. Um, but I think that I think that Herbert is an interesting one because I could see him easily having a better season than Joe Burrow at any point. And I think that those two have to be super interchangeable for you. And then Lawrence, I also think, um, has a real shot to be like an NFL MVP candidate this year. I think that a lot of the pieces are lining up. And if you're making like a dark horse call, he's the most like clearly obvious guy as like the perfect dark horse candidate where he's got Doug Peterson calling plays for him. He's got Calvin Ridley coming back and all of these sort of pieces are lining up and you just hope if the offensive line can, can stay up, um, he's going to be really good this year. So yeah, I like those three call. a lot. I don't know. Go, go check your favorite sports book for Lamar Jackson, uh, not Lamar Jackson, Trevor Lawrence, MVP yeah. odds. Mm -hmm. They've also got a pretty mediocre defense and a really bad division. So potential to win a lot of games and win them by throwing the ball. I think that's a yeah. good call. Score. Uh, points. Yeah. I, I, yeah. I think Burrow Herbert and Lawrence should all be not totally interchangeable, but I don't think they should be. I don't think Joe Burrow should be so far out ahead of the pack mm -hmm. as the rankings would indicate. Like Justin Herbert was in consideration for the one Oh one overall in dynasty a couple years ago. I think people forget that. And I think that was crazy, but he has all the same sort of passing ceiling that Joe Burrow does. He just doesn't have the same kind of NFL accolades that Joe mm, Burrow does that I exactly. think. Exactly. Yeah. Like 
people remember watching Joe Burrow play in the Super Bowl and you know play some exciting playoff games, whereas Justin Herbert was sitting at home for reasons mostly outside of his control. Hmm. Whereas in the regular season, like he's always been near the league lead in pass attempts. He has great weapons around him. He's an elite passer. It in a given season, either one of these guys could be the leading scorer. So you don't need to overpay to get into Joe Burrow if you can get a Herbert and to a lesser extent Lawrence, who I, I agree is going to take that leap. Fields is maybe the most confusing here because he has arguably a higher ceiling than those three guys, but a much, much lower floor. And so it becomes a, a philosophical question of, are you willing to risk it on someone like Fields who, if he doesn't progress as a passer this year, doesn't have a lot of time left in the league probably. Uh, but if he does put it together as a passer, he could replicate Lamar Jackson's 2019 season where he puts up that 24 points per game because when he starts running, I mean, dude is lightning fast. He has, he had multiple like 50, 60 yard rushing plays last year. So he can go absolutely insane. And he has some new weapons in DJ Moore, or I guess one new weapon. And then he's got Mooney, Claypool, Komet. So he has a decent cast of characters around him. Can Fields put it all together? Um, I would like to say yes. Um, but really, like you said, I don't know. Um, they invested in the O line, they added weapons around him, and they've tried to upgrade their defense a bit this offseason. Um, and he he passed the first test, which was are they gonna keep him or the number one overall pick? So that was a good sign, and that's really all we have to go off right now is that they're behind him and that's why he's sort of left crept up into this this tier two of dynasty quarterbacks. Um, he's the one, only one of the eight that we've talked about so far who I would consider taking Jefferson and Chase over. I think that the other seven have to be taken before those two elite receivers. And then once you get to fields, I totally get it. If that risk of, like you said, him not being in the league much longer, if that's just too much for you, you can take a receiver. But other than that, it should mm -hmm. be straight straight quarterbacks in the first. Yeah, I think that's super fair, especially when you look at the quarterbacks that you can get in the early second, who we'll talk about shortly. Uh, I think that's a fair call. I will say Fields is the one guy in this tier that I'm not actively trying to acquire. So like if, if a deal opens up and I can go buy Justin Fields for what I think is a reasonable price, I'm still going to do it because I, I want to get one of these quarterbacks. Like it doesn't really matter which one, but I'm not going out of my way to send tons of offers out to the Justin Fields owners because I am a little bit wary. And I, and I do think, you know, he's already going like eighth, ninth overall. If he is what we think, I don't think he's going to become so much more priced up that I can't just buy him then. So yeah, I, I'm, yeah, I'm willing to wait on it a little bit. Like I still think he's going to be behind Mahomes, Allen hurts Lamar and probably burrow just because of the way people seem to value burrow. So it's like, yeah. What am I getting by buying the ninth overall pick before he becomes the sixth overall pick when I can just like maybe wait and see if he does develop this year? And if you are pushing a Justin Fields offer out there, up your bid slightly and see what the Justin Herbert owner thinks, because I think that those two are I think that Herbert's a wildly safer and more insulated asset. And I think that he's going to give you a similar level of production that you could expect from him. So I don't know. Yeah, Fields I is mean, tricky. I don't think we have enough like sample size in the NFL to conclude that pocket passers have more longevity in their careers than the mobile quarterbacks. But the mm -hmm. fact remains that that's how the market feels. Like if you're not factoring in 10, 12 years of Herbert and Lawrence, it doesn't really make sense to price them where they are because their ceiling isn't that much higher than guys you can get later. It's like, it's the fact that you know they're going to be in that range each and every year and that they're going to give you a decade plus. So the market is factoring in more longevity for the pocket passers. And so whether or not you do, you still need to keep that in mind when you're making these deals. And so buying into somebody like Herbert, even if you prefer like a Lamar Jackson, just that's getting you a bargaining chip where you can maybe try to make that deal down the road. Uh, but don't shy away from getting into these guys because they are going to have so much value insulation and they are really good and they're going to score a lot of fantasy points. They might not break your league like uh, Patrick Mahomes could, but they're still going to win you games. So, Definitely. yeah. Now getting into a little more of the numbers again, I talked about 24 plus point per game seasons. I also have the numbers here for 20 to 23 point per game seasons, 20 points per game is kind of an arbitrary number, but that's where I would consider to be your 
like league winning quarterbacks. Uh, now again, I'm talking about four points per passing touchdown. So I just wanted to look back again, last 10 seasons, eight or more games played. What do the numbers look like? How many quarterbacks are there breaking that 20 point per game threshold? Is there anything we can learn about those guys? So anywhere from 20 to 23.9 points per game, we've had an average of 4.8 quarterbacks per season hitting that range. So basically locked in to be a top six, seven quarterback at worst, if you're breaking that 20 point barrier and the results are pretty telling. Um, first of all, it seems to be increasing as the league becomes more pass heavy. That's just logical, but there were only three guys last year that did it. So you had Mahomes, Allen hurts above that tier. Mm -hmm. And then you had Lamar fields and burrow were the only other quarterbacks over that mark before that though, we had like nine in 2021, seven seven it was a ton of high-end quarterback seasons and there are a lot of familiar names on this list we've got justin fields once kyler murray's on there a few times lamar jackson's on there a few times um cam newton joe burrow uh deshaun watson dak prescott who are both in that next tier mm -hmm. that we're going to talk about uh and then you have some of the like elite passing quarterbacks of yesteryear you have drew Brees, tom brady aaron Rodgers. Ben Roethlisberger, Matt Ryan, Andrew Luck. Uh, mm -hmm. So for the most part, these are players that we know are either one, uh, one of the best passers in the NFL, or two, a good passer and incredibly mobile. And you have some guys that are a combination, like Deshaun Watson, Russell Wilson, have been high-end passers and also mobile. Um, Dak Prescott, to an extent, Kyler Murray, to an extent, Lamar Jackson, obviously. There are really only four exceptions where you don't have a like top five passing player or high end mobility. And that was Kirk Cousins, who somehow hit 20 points per game on the dot in 2020. Pretty impressive. Whoa. Uh Ryan Tannehill did it the year before. And uh let's see. Sorry, I lost my list. Matt Stafford did it last year. Mm -hmm. With okay. the Rams, his resurgence with the Rams. And then Nick Foles did it all the way back in 2013. Um, he, he didn't play every game that season, but I, I believe that was the year he threw 27 touchdowns and two interceptions. And he had a seven touchdown game against your Raiders, Ben. I think you were like eight years old at that point, but uh, it was one to remember. <laughs> uh, I did, in fact, not watch that game, but I, I believe it happened. And <laughs> the, the main takeaway, and I also another thing that I think is sort of going unspoken between me and you here is you need one of you need at least one of these guys on every single dynasty roster you have and if you don't have Correct. one of these guys on your dynasty roster you should yep. be doing everything in your power to go out and acquire one today yeah that's what i'm driving towards here so you can see that that 20 to 23 points per game is more achievable than the 24 point threshold obviously but it's still a significant edge because there aren't that many guys doing it year in and year out and the key point here is that it's somewhat predictable like not perfectly predictable on a year to year basis, but there are a lot of repeat names in here and the traits that these players have are, you know, pretty measurable. Like if you can't expect this player to be like a top five passer in the league, then they better be rushing for like 500, 600 yards minimum. Right. Mm -hmm. So you can kind of check guys off and you can see that everybody in this young elites tier and a few guys in our next tier, check all these boxes. They're guys that we've already seen do it, right? Lamar's done it. Burrow's done it. Herbert fields, Lawrence, not yet, but he showed us what we need to see to expect that he can make that leap. And then going mm -hmm. down, you know, Deshaun Watson, Kyler Murray, Dak Prescott, you're going to see, that's why we're, we're high on these guys. Like we're, I think both of us higher than the general market is uh, because they've done it. And once mm -hmm. they've done it, we know they can continue doing it. Right. Uh, so yeah, you want to go out and trade for these guys because they offer you something that frankly, the guys below them can't do. We've only seen really four outlier seasons from guys. You wouldn't expect to hit that 20 point per game number, you know, four over the last 10 years. So if you're thinking that the quarterback you draft in round seven, round eight is going to just jump up into this zone, they probably aren't. It's, it's not common. And if they yeah. are, they better have some incredible skills, you know, some makes maybe make some kind of leap, right? Like somebody like a Trey Lance who we'll talk about way later is like, mm -hmm. that's a guy where if he can put all this stuff together, get on the field for the 49ers, at least you can see the path. But with somebody like a Derek Carr, Kirk cousins to a tag of a low, like 
they don't really have the path that we need to see to get into this range. And so they're, they're always going to be a little bit less valuable. Yeah, no, that's, that's all really good points. And I mean, like you said, with, with Lance, uh, you, uh, there are a few guys who actually could see a path towards some kind of 20 plus point per game finish. But really, once you get past these top eight, 12, 13 guys, um, you're really starting to, th you're, you're, you're starting to get into some dart throws and you really don't know. And as at the quarterback position, when we're playing super flex, you, you just, it, it can't be overstated how important it is to have one of these 20 plus point scorers, at least one of them yeah, on your lineup. Because they score a ton of points, which helps you win games, but they're also the safest store of value that you can possibly have. Right. It's like, mm -hmm. it, it they're like made out of gold. Like that's how yeah. valuable they are. You, you can't trade for them without giving up the world unless you already have one that you can trade to get that Russell guy. Wilson so, just had the worst year we've ever seen from anyone apparently <laughs> and he's still like a top seven round startup pick yeah and he's like 33 34 years old mm -hmm. so yeah exactly quarterbacks are super valuable if you look at just the points they're scoring most of the quarterbacks going in the middle rounds are like massively overvalued but it's due to positional scarcity because you need in super flex you need two of them to be you know a viable competitor so let's look at this next tier, which I'm calling the rookies and the disrespected. We have six names. Three of them are rookies. Three of them are veterans. And in order of ADP, they are Anthony Richardson, Deshaun Watson, Bryce Young, Kyler Murray, Dak Prescott, and CJ Stroud. So it's a mixture throughout of our top three rookie quarterbacks and three guys who, like I said, have all cracked this 20 to 23 points per game threshold. Uh, all of them more than once, I believe. And, and yet we're seeing a discount on Watson, Kyler, Dak. Ben, what say you about these three? I love those three. And I have um, I have Kyler ranked at the top of this tier personally. And I think that Watson and Dak should be in the upper half of this tier as well. Um, Richardson is the only of the rookies who I think should be valued close to or above. I think that and this is something that I think you're going to agree on, but I think that Young and Stroud are both a little bit steep right now um, as far as their prices go. Um, but just to harker back to, or, um, over to Kyler, he's really, really good. He's in a, This is an elite dynasty quarterback that we're talking about who last before, before this injury last year was in that elite conversation in the same tier as the, albeit towards the back of the tier, as the the burrows and the herberts and uh he's fallen out of that and it makes sense i would i get why people are scared you don't know if he's going to be in arizona next year we don't like the coach in arizona anymore and they're getting rid of their weapons it's a weird um it's a weird situation in general but the fact of the matter is that kyler murray is a very good pocket passer and he's also very good outside of the pocket and he's a good rusher and that's what we've been talking about this whole episode of these are the kind of guys that you need to have on your dynasty rosters these are the most valuable assets they're made yep. out of gold and there's just there's no universe in which kyler murray in 2024 is not producing a very adequate amount of fantasy points so there's no reason for us to be fading him the way that a lot of people are yeah kyler murray is my most rostered dynasty quarterback because he's the most attainable out of these guys like i would put him in tier two if i was making the tiers like I said, I used ADP. That's why he's not in tier two. But I would have Watson and Kyler and maybe even Dak in that last tier we talked about. But Kyler, it, it's so weird, this idea that sprang up like overnight that he's bad at football. Where it's, it's like, so oh, strange. yeah, he's a great fantasy quarterback, but he can't play. Like, no, 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 no. That's ridiculous. Like, in 2021, he was legitimately like one of the better passers in the league. Like easily he was an MVP 10. candidate for eight yeah. weeks. Uh, people forget that. Like by the, after week 11, he was like the favorite for MVP. Yeah. Like, he wasn't, he wasn't bad. And then last year he wasn't even that bad either. Like he had a down season, but we all know cliff Kingsbury was a clown. Yeah. DeAndre Hopkins was suspended. Like but, uh, Marquise Brown got hurt too. The O-line was bad. Like there are so many reasons why he had a down season. He didn't forget how to play football. He, he is at worst a fringe top 10 quarterback and 
he's not at risk of not playing in the NFL. Like if the Cardinals get the number one overall pick and they draft Caleb Williams, I really couldn't care less because he's going to get traded to another team and start there. I'm not worried about him leaving the Cardinals. He will start for an NFL team. As yeah. long as players like Desmond Ritter are starting NFL games, I can assure you Kyler Murray will have a home in the NFL. And when he's playing, every time he's playing, he is a top six fantasy quarterback, like without fail. Yep, pretty much. And like you said, it's either they're going to be adding Caleb and he'll be somewhere else or they're going to add Marvin Harrison Jr. And then everyone's going to be in love with Kyler Murray because he's got a new top three shiny toy for us. And it's just it's absurd. I got him at the back of the second in the new DFF startup. I got him at the 209. Yeah. His, that's AD, insane. his ADP that's is the ridiculous. 212. His ADP is the 212. I mean, it's, it's crazy. It's so low. Yeah, I go out and try to trade for him in any league that you can because here's the thing. We know players coming back from ACLs, at least good players, gain value as they get closer to returning. We saw this with J.K. Dobbins. We're going to see it with Javante Williams. We've seen with Brees Hall how he's maintained value. Like, Kyler is going to see an increase in value as he approaches returning to the field. And when he comes back on the field and he continues to be an elite fantasy quarterback, which is what I expect, he's going to be right back in that first round. People want to worry about his ACL. Uh, Deshaun Watson tore his ACL. The next season, he was a top six fantasy quarterback. Right now, he's torn his ACL twice, by the way. Pretty sure he tore it in college, too. He's he's going around ahead. And he has all these character concerns. And he's yeah. older than Kyler. Like. Kyler Murray is not done for. He's like 26 years old, 25 years old, and he yeah. tore his ACL. Whatever. He's going to come back. He can, he, rushing quarterbacks, like there's not enough data to say one way or the other, but we don't have data to prove that he won't run anymore. Like that is, that is just a narrative. We don't know that to be, to be certain. I've seen some numbers where certain quarterbacks actually ran more the year after they tore their ACL. And then some ran a little less, but eventually got back up to where they were. So we, we really don't know how it's going to impact him. What we know is what he's done in the past. And so that's what I want to invest in. And yeah, when you contrast him with Bryce young and CJ Stroud, two quarterback prospects who don't rush like absolute stone worst rushing prospect profiles you'll see from a college quarterback. I, I don't get why they're going so high when their path to being in this range, like we said, like if you don't rush is to be a top five passer in the NFL. So you have these two rookie quarterbacks who, yeah, they're good prospects. They're being airdropped into some of the worst passing game weapons you've seen, you see in the NFL. And we're just assuming that they're immediately going to start producing like top five quarterbacks. I, I don't understand how they can maintain this value. Like how, how is this rational? I don't understand it either. And the way that I sort of think about it is, or the way that I try to rationalize it in my head of what people are thinking is they must be thinking, okay, we have two guys who are guaranteed to be great pocket passers, which means that we have 15 years of amazing production because they're both 21. And that's just not, <laughs> it's just not a guarantee. That's not, that's just not how it works. There's no, there's no way that you can reasonably say that you th think that both of these guys are guaranteed to be elite producers. There's still a chance that they're both yeah. busts. We have once no upon idea. a time, once upon a time, Baker Mayfield was thought to be the yeah. next elite quarterback. Once upon a time, Andrew Luck wasn't going to retire at age 29. Once upon a time, Jared Goff was the best prospect in the draft. Like there is no guarantee, especially with pocket passers. Like at least with mobile yeah. quarterbacks, you can know with some level of certainty that when they're on the field, they're going to score points uh, with pocket passers. We can't even guarantee the points like Joe Burrow had a pretty solid rookie rookie season before he got hurt and he wasn't usable in fantasy. So mm -hmm. you don't even know when you're going to be able to play Bryce Young or CJ Stroud, let alone whether they're going to be good, let alone whether they're going to be the top five passer that they're going to have to be to put up consecutive 20 point per game seasons. Like I think they're good players, but it's far more likely that they fall into the Kirk Cousins range of fantasy scoring than it is that they become Deshaun Watson or even Dak Prescott. So exactly, yeah. You're you're factoring in way too much ceiling. Whereas at least with Anthony Richardson, like he has like top five overall ceiling if he can if he can learn how to throw the football right. Like I, it's still I think a low percentage bet, and I think he's going too high. But at least that bet makes sense. You're not going to see C.J. Stroud or Bryce Young become an asset that you can't trade for overnight. He, they're much more similar to Tua, in my opinion who is going after them despite already having like an incredibly efficient passing season. Maybe it's all due to concussions. I don't know, 
but he heads off our next tier, which is just two players. And I call this tier no man's land because it's just two guys that are going within like a three round range of ADP and it's Tua and it's Daniel Jones. So let's start with Tua because I think he has some clear parallels to Young and Stroud. What are you, what are your thoughts on Tua? I have no problem grouping Tua with Young and Stroud as a tier at, at, at all. I think that Tua had a great year last year and his production was definitely not something to scoff at, but from a pure like NFL player perspective, I do think that he's just kind of mid in a way. Like he's, he doesn't do anything like amazingly well, in my opinion. I think he's decent um, as far as his accuracy goes, his arm as we all know it's not like a world beating kind of arm. And I think that his anticipation is a little bit overrated. I think that people hail him as like the greatest tight window thrower in the entire league. And he's just not that. <laughs> um, he, are there a lot good. of tight windows on the field when Tyree kill and Jalen Waddle? Are exactly. Out there <laughs> exactly. I saw a graphic recently too, that was talking about the percentage of like yards after yards that were gained after the catch. And he's like at the bottom of the list and I'm like, okay, I mean, he's throwing it to guys who are wide open and then they just run a few steps and they're in the end zone. It's cool. But like, I don't know you it's, it's hard for me to watch Tua and think to myself, that's the guy right there that I'm trying to get right now. Um, Mm -hmm. So I guess to an extent it's kind of gut analytics, but I think that, I think that he does, I, and he's not valued as if he has an elite ceiling. So there's no, there's nothing wrong with saying that he doesn't have an elite ceiling, I guess. But yeah, I know, can't speak good. to his film. I can't speak to his film because I don't, you know, I don't, I don't study it like you do, but he definitely mm-hmm. gives me like Alex Smith vibes in the sense that he's more, he strikes me as more of like a game manager where you yeah. put everything in place around him and he can perform at a very high level, but it's not necessarily due to any one aspect of his game. Like, not a, there's no like signature traits or incredible talent it's just he's smart and he does everything adequately and when you give him two of the best wide receivers in the nfl he can have a top five season in epa yeah. and guess what he has those weapons and he's gonna have those weapons so i i think his adp is fair and i i think young and stroud should be going probably behind him but if not behind him then in the same general area yeah, he's kind of their ceiling outcome in a lot of ways. Same with, um, I guess you could say that like Kyler Dak Watson could be the ceiling outcome for the, for the rookies. But I think that, that I think that two is a much more realistic ceiling for for those guys. Yeah, yeah. I mean, anybody we, we don't know enough to say anybody can't be the next Justin Herbert or Joe Burrow because mm-hmm. we didn't even really like Justin Herbert as a prospect, you know, the, the, speaking for the industry in general. So I can't say that he they won't be those guys, but they don't come around very often. And I think if you're betting on a guy like, yeah, I think as a rookie, they're going to come out and lead the league in pass attempts and throw 30 plus touchdowns. And that's why I'm going to take them in the second round of the startup. That's a very thin bet, and I really wouldn't be making it, especially when you can literally just trade them straight up for the guys that have already done that. Just seems confusing to me. Um, Let's talk about Daniel Jones then, the other guy in this tier who I think has what I would consider a phantom ceiling. Like you think that it's there, but it doesn't actually exist. Uh, Daniel Jones last season had his kind of breakout year in year four where – he put up 18.4 points per game, which isn't even really close to that threshold I was talking about, that 20 points per game. It was lower than Geno Smith. It was almost identical to Tua and Kirk Cousins. And I think his ADP is inflated because people see room for growth. They see what Brian Dable did with Josh Allen, and they're like, oh, well, what if he does it again? Well, first of all, we have Jones entering year five, where Josh Allen had his big breakout in year three. So we're already like past that part of Daniel Jones's career where we should really be expecting big jumps in passing ability. But that being said, he overperformed last year as a rusher. Like when you look at expected points, especially in terms of rushing touchdowns, he was well over expectation. So you can't look at Daniel Jones's points per game and say, well, if he's just a little bit better as a passer and he adds a few more touchdowns, maybe a couple hundred more yards, he's right there at 20 points per game. No, 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 it doesn't work that way. First, you have to correct his rushing touchdowns down to expected, 
which is they're probably turning into passing touchdowns, in which case he's going to need to be much better as a passer than you actually think in order to make that kind of jump. He's, we can't just assume he's going to continue to be a rushing outlier and add the passing, especially when, what did they bring in this year? Darren Waller? Outside of Darren Waller, who, who did they add? They brought in Jalen Hyatt in the third round, Paris Campbell. I mean, this is not an inspiring cast of weapons. So it's not like those are going to carry him like we saw from Tua or, you know, like Joe Burrow has elite weapons. Justin Herbert has elite weapons. Daniel Jones is not in that position. So I, I don't really see room for improvement. Yeah. Like you said, there's just nothing really elite about him as a fantasy asset, and there's nothing really elite about him as an NFL player either. Um, a lot of the stuff that, like like you brought up, Brian Dable is really good, but a lot of stuff that they did last year to help Jones sort of break out was really gimmicky. There was a lot of flats that they threw, a lot of play action, a lot of screens, a lot of really weird slot stuff, which is why we saw, saw Isaiah Hodgins play so well towards the end of the year was all they were doing is just having him run a sticker out and they were just having Jones pitch it to whichever sticker out was open. And that's fine. And it's just not conducive to elite or even like very good fantasy production. So Jones is definitely a guy I'm actively looking to, to, uh, to move, to pivot off of, um, especially since the contract extension, now that there's this like false sense of security, because it's really a two year <laughs> deal. It's not really right. a four year deal. Um, I, I'm definitely like I'm throwing a couple picks on top of it and trying to tear up. Um, so I, I, I'm with you there on on being wary of Jones. Yeah, I mean, try to take either of these guys, Tua or Daniel Jones, and like number one, go put those guys in a package offer with you know, maybe a wide receiver, like someone like Jalen Waddle. Like if you pack Jalen Waddle and Daniel Jones together, you might be within striking distance of a Jalen Hurts or a Lamar Jackson or something like that. Mm -hmm. um, or, you know, maybe a slightly lesser asset, maybe like a Ken Walker, Travis Etienne or something to get up into the, the Watson zone or the Justin Fields zone. That's what I'd be looking to do. I don't want to hold on to these guys longer than I have to. And I'm willing to tear down into this next group if I can get, you know, a first round pick on top, or I can get a, a player I like on top. And this next tier, these are all guys that can score in that same zone. They might be a little bit older. They might be a little bit grosser, but they can score in the same zone. And this is tier five. It's this is called Lance and the low ceilings. So we have one guy here who kind of sticks out, which is Trey Lance. The rest of the guys in the tier, Kirk Cousins, Jared Goff, Kenny Pickett, Russell Wilson, Geno Smith, Jordan Love, Derek Carr, and Aaron Rodgers. So Trey Lance is kind of uniquely positioned here because he has all the upside in the world, the same kind of upside that Anthony Richardson has, but he is way, way, way down for, you know, some fair reasons. We don't know when he's going to start. It seems like Brock Purdy is the presumed starter in San Francisco. Trey Lance has some, some really bad vibes around him early in his career. We just don't know if he's going to play. That being said at his current cost in the sixth round, I'm happy to invest in him because I still believe in the upside. Like I said, he's, he's a prolific rushing prospect and he has a ton of arm strength. And so I think he could put up a lot of points if he gets on the field and early draft picks tend to get a lot of chances, right? Sam Darnold is on his third team. Now he started a bunch of games and he's never been good. Uh, we've seen this with early, early round quarterbacks. So I think there's a good chance that Trey Lance gets to start sooner than later and i'm yeah. willing to you know pay into this range to see what happens when he does i like lance a lot as a value at cost like you said um <laughs> lance, but i'm just lance not a lot. <laughs> yeah i'm um yeah i like him a lot at cost but i'm just not like, like hedging my bets on him fully as like a someone I'm, I'm going to rely on as a potential QB one, but it's sort of a thing where if you can get a good value on him he's absolutely mm -hmm. worth worth taking a shot on um because you really wouldn't be giving up too too much yeah and if you're doing a startup where you plan to maybe have a productive struggle year one or if you're on a, in a dynasty league where you don't think your team's going to contend this year i think he's the perfect guy to go out and get because you, you can hold on to him and see if he gets that chance to start you don't really need the points from him right away and he has unique levels of potential to gain value of any other guy in that range. And so, yeah, maybe he goes to zero and you're a little bit further behind in your rebuild, but you have the potential to really jumpstart it. If he can become that QB one that we thought he could be. Yeah. 
And I mean that there's not enough that can be said about the infrastructure he has surrounding him in San Francisco. If he is able yeah. to earn that starting quarterback spot and hold it for the foreseeable future, he's got an absolutely elite stable of weapons with an elite offensive line and one of the best play callers we have in the entire league right now. And really like the ceiling would be pretty limitless for him if he's able to, if he's able to get his stuff together over there. Yeah. He's, he's really in the best possible spot. If you could just get that, just get, if you could just get Brock Purdy out of the way, it'd be absolutely perfect for him. Um, everything else is in place. Now, other guys in this tier, you know, like we said, these are guys that are, are not likely to approach that 20 to 23 point per game ceiling, that difference making ceiling. But most of these players are what you'd consider capable QB twos guys that you can slot into your super flex spot and expect 17, 18 points per game. Certainly Kirk cousins has been that over the last several years. Geno Smith jumped into that conversation last year. I think he's one of the more cost effective players uh, to fill that role for your team who maybe has a little bit of ceiling, right? He, he was like eighth in quarterback rushing yards last year. He has incredible weapons around him. So he's one of my favorite guys in this range, but Russell Wilson too, you know, we could see a resurgence if he can be 90% of what he used to be. He, he has, he has a pretty solid ceiling, maybe not 20 points per game, but he could be in that QB nine QB 10 realm. And for the price you're paying, that's, that's fantastic. Yeah, Gino's the guy that I was going to try to, that I was going to highlight in this tier too, because I think that if there's anyone other than Lance who could really think about hitting that twenty point per game um, sort of milestone that we've been talking about, I think that it really could be Gino. He was one of the best passers in the entire league this past season, um, just point blank. He was just really good. He was elite on on deep throws and he was good in the intermediate and short range he was great going through his progressions and he threw with some really impressive velocity and he had a lot of really impressive tight window throws the ones um a lot of ones to tyler lockett kind of stand out to me from last year where he just sort of dropped it right in the bucket where it was supposed to be with a lot of defenders around him um so i don't know i think gino's really good and i think that he could he could be primed for a pretty big upcoming season with the weapons that he has around him now yeah i <laughs> People are always hesitant to buy into, you know, one season of production, especially for a player who hasn't done anything throughout his career. But it's really hard to do what he did accidentally. Like yeah. he was like top five in deep ball completion percentage, pressured completion percentage. Like he was really, really strong in some areas that only good passers are strong in. Like you, you can't fake it. Like I don't think it's manufactured. He genuinely figured something out while he was sitting on the bench all those years, and now he's really good. And yep you should just be okay with that. Like buy in. He's not that expensive and he's just as likely to score 20 points per game. In my opinion, as Daniel Jones. So take the four round discount, take Geno Smith. He might um, be old, but just ride the wave while you can. It's going to be, it's going to be a fun couple of years for, for Gino. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, 32, like he's not, he's not washed up yet. You've got a mm -hmm. few years. Uh, uh, Kenny Pickett and Jordan love are kind of the other young guys in this tier. My issue with them is that, they're bad at football and they don't have ceilings. So what do you think about these players and their ADPs? Um, it's pretty gross. I don't, uh, I really am. I don't have any Kenny Pickett shares and I have no plans on acquiring any. Um, I am, I do have like a couple love shares and those I'm, I'm a little uneasy about, especially hearing you talk about Jordan love. Cause I know <laughs> that I know that you really don't like Jordan love, but like you said, there's not much to go off that they've done. And there's not a ton of cause for optimism. I will say that I think Love has a bit more cause for hope than, than Kenny Pickett. I think that he has a cool weapon around him in <laughs> Christian Watson. And I think that maybe Matt LaFleur is actually a good coach. I guess we'll see. Um, but I don't know. Once once you're getting into this range, it's you don't feel good about it regardless. But I feel I feel marginally better about Love than I do about Pickett. Yeah, I mean, for me to say that they're bad at football when we've seen so little from them is like obviously a little hyperbolic. It's just, mm -hmm. you know, they were both late first round picks at quarterback, which already is kind of a red flag. Like that usually doesn't work out. I know it did for Lamar Jackson, but again, the rushing quarterbacks are just a little bit different. Mm -hmm. um, so that's not a ringing endorsement. You know, we haven't seen anything from Love over the last three seasons while he's been sitting on the bench, but 
the problem is even if he, the problem is that with rookie quarterbacks, like we don't expect them to be good right away. And so they maintain value, but with Jordan love going into his fourth season, I just don't think he's going to have that same kind of value insulation. And so when I consider the ceiling outcome, which I think is basically Daniel Jones, who had his own year four breakout last year, won a playoff game, got a contract, et cetera. Like if love does all of that, he's going to go in the fourth round of startups. That's not the kind of bet that I really am looking to make there. I would much rather just take the guys that I know are going to score 17, 18 points per game. And I would rather roll the dice on like a Desmond Ritter or a Sam Howell rounds later, who I think are similar bets. So, yeah, I don't know. I do disagree with you a little bit on the Daniel Jones comparison. I think that maybe from like a production standpoint, that's uh, not too far off the mark, but I think that, I think that, mainly talking about their traits, especially Jordan Love's arm, gives mm-hmm. him a little bit more of a of a potential to be like, okay, well, this is a good, like a, a good solid football player. I think that he right. at least flashed a little bit when he came came in and stepped in and, and filled in for Rodgers in that Philly game. But like you said, there's really just not enough to go off. But I, I think that I think that the ceiling outcome has a bit more high level foot quarterback play with Love than with Jones or with Pickett. He could be a better passer, but I guess my counter argument would be we know That's that fair. Love can't argue. Okay, he can't offer what Daniel Jones offers on the ground, and I feel like that kind of neutralizes the two. I guess I'm just thinking in terms of what would Love have to do in order to be considered in that like Tua range or you know up into the third round of startups because Daniel Jones had his QB1 season. Mm-hmm. He won a playoff game. He got a four-year extension. He runs, which like already is a thing people look for, which love doesn't do. So like Mm -hmm. how impressive would he have to be as a passer to outdo what Daniel Jones just did? Because they're in the same place in their career. You know what I'm saying? Like, yeah, that's fair. And yeah, yeah, it's a tough path. mm -hmm. You're you're projecting a like you said, you'd be projecting a pretty huge year for Jordan Love for him to jump up to like being equal to Daniel Jones, much less, much less leapfrogging him as a dynasty asset. Um, and I definitely go, she mean with, with, the, with the rushing upside. That's a good point for sure. Yeah. So it's, it's when I, I certainly don't, I don't rule anything out of the range of outcomes. Like as far as I'm concerned, just about anything can happen. We yep. are not that good at projecting ceilings and stuff. So he could be the next coming of Tom Brady for all I care. But when I'm looking at like realistic range of outcomes, I, I think the floor where he just isn't that good and he's a year four quarterback and he just drops off the map. Like that risk outweighs for me any like fringy outcomes where he becomes an elite player. And so I'm just avoiding him at his cost. Yeah. That's, that's the main thing. If he was going a lot later, I'd be more interested in buying in. It's just not the cost. I want to make the bet on. We don't hate players. We hate ADPs as, as people tend to say. Mm -hmm. Uh, All right, well, let's move on to our last tier here, which I call the danger zone. And that zone is a mixture of total unknowns and mostly washed up veterans. So we have in ADP order, Will Levis, Brock Purdy, Mac Jones, Desmond Ritter, Matthew Stafford, Sam Howell, Jimmy Garoppolo, Hendon Hooker, Ryan Tannehill, and Baker Mayfield. Now for me, what sticks out immediately is Matthew Stafford. I feel like he doesn't belong here. Like if you've seen that meme with all the soldiers and then there's the clown and it's yeah. like, doesn't belong. It's like the opposite. It's like a bunch of clowns and Matthew Stafford is like the one soldier in the picture. Like <laughs> as far as I'm concerned, he should be with those other guys in ADP. Like he's the same age and the same ability as cousins, a Russell Wilson, maybe a little, maybe if Russ is at his peak form, maybe not, but you know, Geno Smith, Derek Carr, et cetera. It's like he's just being discounted because he had an injury last season. Yeah. He is a little older than those other guys, too, that we mentioned. But like you said, it's really the injury that's causing the discount. And he was really good the last time we saw him fully healthy with a fully healthy stable around him. And not much has changed over there um, since they were, I guess, a good amount has changed over there. But there's a lot (laughs) of the same pieces still in place from their Super Bowl year that you have... um, Mm-hmm. You have McVeigh still around. You still have Cooper Cup playing at a super high level. And that's level. all you need. That's it. And that's Just all you need. Um, yeah. But beyond that, I mean, my guy Cam Akers is going to take a step next year. And hopefully the offensive line is able to improve. And 
you know, you have, I don't know, Tyler Higbee. There's, and, there's, uh, there, there's stuff going on in, in LA and, and there's reason P- to Puka be Nakua is getting, yeah. getting OTA hype or, you, you know, have the next Robert Woods on your team as well. So Van I don't know. Jefferson's I th- still kicking around, you know? Yeah. <laughs> I, I think that the interesting thing with this tier is like, do we feel like comfortable with these guys at our QB two slot or are we like actively pivoting off and trying to upgrade? I don't feel comfortable, no, but I think more people need to be comfortable being uncomfortable in Dynasty. Like, mm-hmm. y- you can, if you can make your peace with these guys and, and kind of ride the wave, especially with someone like a Matt Stafford and allocate value elsewhere on your team, like, you're making a bet with like more of an upside case as opposed to, oh, well, I'm not, I'm worried about Matt Stafford. So I'm going to pay a whole bunch of extra to go get Kirk Cousins, who's basically the same guy. <laughs> and now you can't allocate that elsewhere on your roster. Like you're playing, it's playing scared. Only one out of 12 managers is going to win in a given season. So I just think we need to be more open to risk like that and maybe more open to slightly more fragile roster constructions. Um, and and you like you said, Stafford is a little bit older than some of those guys, but in terms of their usable window, like we don't know if any of the guys I mentioned in the last year are going to be playing in three years. So as far as I'm concerned, they're all functionally the same kind of guy, right? Like the younger players maybe, but Geno Smith, Russell Wilson, Kirk Cousins, we don't know if they're going to be playing in a couple of years. So I think Stafford has a couple of years left, and I so I'm willing to kind of bunch him in, you know, maybe the back end of that tier, but certainly not multiple rounds of discount like we've been seeing. Yeah, and our guy Chris over in the DFF Discord has been or had a had a week there where he was pretty adamant emphasizing the contract that Matthew Stafford's under and how that sort of provides an extra blanket of security that people aren't really factoring into Matthew Stafford's value right now. I think he's locked down for like the next 4 years pretty much, so. Yeah, that's a great point, you know. We don't know what's going to happen with the Rams. Maybe McVay packs it up and Stafford and him ride off into the sunset with their Lombardi trophies. But I don't know. I, I'm just going to expect him to play until he says he's not going to play. Like yeah. He's making a ton of money and he's still a good quarterback. So I, I'm not just going to project stuff like that to happen. Like Usually 34-year-old quarterbacks that are good keep playing. So I'm going to assume he's going to keep playing. Hmm. Uh, let's let's touch on a few guys in this tier. I think there's, this is like because we're getting so far into startup drafts, there's like the widest disparity between some of these players and the widest ranges of opinions. Like Hendon hooker is a guy that I don't think has any business being in this tier. Like I, I wouldn't be surprised if he never starts a game in the NFL. I don't really know why people are baking that in, but I'm right there with you. Yeah. Uh, yeah. Please talk about him because I know you, oh, you know, yeah. prospect, you look at film and stuff. So, I just, I don't get it. I don't get it at all with Hooker. I, there was a maybe a world before the ACL injury where I was like, I could be talked into it, but he is like so immobile. He has, has no wiggle in the pocket at all. And he takes, because of that, he takes more sacks that I, than I think that he should and sacks that he shouldn't be taking. Like there's something to be said about, you know, Bryce Young not having the highest, um, sack or the best sack rate in this class but when you're talking about hooker it's like he's taking bad sacks um anyways they run a lot of gimmicky stuff in tennessee that's not going to translate super well he's 25 which is crazy i i don't (laughs) even know he's he's older than most of the guys we talked about at the beginning of the show yeah no he's (laughs) it's uh I don't know. It seems like there's a ton of red flags there that we're ignoring in the late second, early third of rookie drafts because it's a quarterback and it's super flex. So we must like him. But like you said, there I think there's a very real chance that he just never starts a game in the NFL. And yeah, I don't know. If the opportunity cost is an early third round pick and you know you're passing off a bunch of guys that are probably never gonna do anything, that's one thing. But when the opportunity cost is like a Matt Stafford type or a Ryan Tannehill even who he's going like two rounds ahead of that's where it doesn't make any sense to me because Davis Mills and Kellen Mond once upon a time went in this exact same range of the NFL draft like being drafted in the late second early third does not guarantee you a shot in the NFL Malik Willis was drafted there and he got to start a few games and it wasn't good and that's it like we're never going to hear from him again Matt yep. Corral went in the third round he broke his foot oh well we're never going to hear from him again like there, there are no guarantees. These are XFL guys we're talking about at this point. Yeah, he's not guaranteed to be the, the succession plan for Jared Goff. And even if he yeah. is, 
frankly, we don't have reason to believe that he's going to succeed in that role. So just not a guy that I have any interest in rostering, to be honest, unless the price goes way, way, way down. Um, But what about somebody like Brock Purdy, who is going ahead of Matthew Stafford, which is, is interesting. But I, know, yeah. in, in his own right, what what are we doing with Brock Purdy? I don't know. I wouldn't be buying him over a guy like Stafford. I wouldn't be drafting him over a guy like Stafford. I don't think there's the same risk with some of the other guys in this tier of like maybe he doesn't never starts an NFL game again. I think that he did enough last year that he will get a job somewhere. Like you said, as long as Desmond Ritter has a starting job, there are starting yeah. jobs out there for, to, be, <laughs> to be taken. Poor Desmond um, Ritter. I'm, I'm yeah. sorry that you're always my punching bag. <laughs> I actually like Ritter too. That's, yeah. that's another guy who I was thinking of talking about in this tier. I think that he could have a big season. Not Hopefully, a big season. Whoa, 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 let me calm down. I think that he could have a <laughs> solid year. Anyways. Let's switch it over to let's switch it to Baker Mayfield. Let's I'm I'm gonna revoke all my, yeah. my Ritter okay. hate. As long as Baker Mayfield is starting games in the NFL. There will always be jobs there available. We go. There we go. Now we don't hurt. Now nobody's feelings are getting hurt. <laughs> okay. Um, yeah. Back to Purdy. Um, I think that I think that he did enough last year, and that he was I don't know serviceable in fantasy last year to the point where he's worth rostering. But I I wouldn't take him over Stafford. Um, I'd probably take Ritter over him. I'm definitely mm-hmm. taking Levis over him. I might take Garoppolo or one of these other guys who you know is going to start for a year or two. Um, who has a past record of solid QB two production over, over a guy like Purdy, who is now coming off a weird arm injury was never really an elite prospect really doesn't check any of the boxes that we're looking for. And it was just kind of a fun story who also produced a few fantasy points last year. Yeah. He's one of those guys, man. I, I don't know what to do with him. Honestly, like gut feeling i i kind of feel like i would take him over most of the guys in this tier i think stafford's a pretty good call especially if you're in contention and you don't want to worry about whether purdy's playing or not but honestly i think i might take him over most of these guys because when you look at like a mac jones desmond ritter sam howell i i think he's shown more already in his career than any of those guys and they're all you know the same age he's started games and one he's won a playoff game like i i think he has enough pedigree now where even if trey lance does somehow beat him out he's probably going to get his chance somewhere else and i like i don't know for sure but i I might just take the shot on him being like the next i don't know kirk cousins Derek carr type of guy who's just like he's never gonna have a ceiling like guarantee i promise you he will never come close to 20 points per game. I'm sure he, if he gets his starting job, even if it's in San Francisco, he's going to top out at 18, but I don't know if it's like the next Jimmy Garoppolo. And we have that guy kicking around the league for another 10 years. Like that might be a guy worth investing in at his price of like a mid to late second, you know, that's true. That's fine. I think that he's definitely a fine investment, especially with that kind of draft capital that you're giving up. You're not really like, especially this year, you're not really getting anything of real, discernible value at the late second early third so if you're going to flip that for purdy who could even if it's a bit of a dice roll could be a very serviceable very serviceable super flex starter that's that's fine yeah i mean he's going where is he going he's going after jonathan mingo and he's going before rashi rice so just in terms of startup value that's like right around a you know mid to you know, 204, 205 sort of range. I'd be comfortable giving that up, especially if, if my quarterback room's a little thin. Like if you have a like a Mahomes type or a Mahomes hurts, Lamar, whatever, and you can make up like a platoon of these island of misfit toys at quarterback, like grab a Ryan Tannehill and a Brock Purdy and Desmond Ritter, and you can just sort of cobble together QB2 production out of that group. I, I think that's pretty doable. And You're it's just recreating not, your soldier and clown meme here. <laughs> yeah, exactly. You get your soldier and your clowns and you just put them all on. <laughs> yeah, I mean, I think you can get by with that. And one of those guys will probably be a fine QB2 most weeks. And, you know, you'll get by. You don't have to pay up for the security of these low ceiling quarterbacks in the, in the tier up. So in some yeah. ways, I kind of prefer this tier just because of how cheap they are and I like leaning into the uncertainty a little bit because some of these guys are, are probably going to be pretty good and they're going to score comparably to the guys above them. Yeah. This really is like the nitty gritty of, 
of fantasy super flex starters. And like you said, you scared money doesn't make money. You got to, if you can uh, have the balls to, to invest your, your, your value elsewhere and keep one of these guys in your starting lineup, that's, it's going to, it could really pay off for you. Yeah, exactly. So that was great. We covered really every relevant quarterback, like after Baker Mayfield at 1408, literally no more quarterbacks go until 1801. And that's Stetson Bennett who Ooh. is, I don't even know why wow. he's getting drafted there, but uh, yeah, I mean, Sam Darnold, Jacoby Brissett, Gardner Minshew are the guys going later. We don't need to talk about them. Yeah. Uh, there's you're you just can, getting into you, backups at that. Yeah. Point. I mean, you can hold them on your bench and wait for an injury. That's fine. Like it's not that they're not rosterable, but there's not really anything actionable to say about them. They're all not very good players who are only going to start by accident. So yeah, yeah, whatever. Pick your poison. Uh, just don't draft sets of Bennett. <laughs> other that, than that how about it <laughs> yeah exactly other than that and don't draft malik willis either i don't yeah know why he please. still has a an adp but yeah other than that go crazy um ben any final thoughts on quarterbacks um buy the elite guys and hold them because that's what you should do and they're really good also well kyler said. murray is good and get him yep buy kyler murray and most of the other guys we talked about in those first two tiers mm -hmm. and you will not regret it. So that's going to do it for us today. Ben, thanks a lot for coming on. It's always great. I'm sure we'll see you here again soon. Uh, everybody else, come back next week. Me and Jacob Sanderson are going to be talking about rebuilding, talking about when you should lean into a rebuild, when you need to stay competitive, how to uh, not overcommit one way or the other. It's going to be a great show. Lots of game theory, lots of philosophy. Uh, you're not going to want to miss it. So tune in next week. See you guys then. Mm -hmm.